All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're here today with Ronald and Neil. I'll let them give their own introductions. Uh, but I'm David Schwed. Uh, I am the COO of Hellborn. I, prior to that, I was the global head of digital assets technology for BNY Mellon. And prior to that, I was the chief security officer for Galaxy Digital. And prior to that, I was in the, the boring world of TradFi, which I won't get into. But I'll turn it over to, to Neil to give his introduction. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Singh. I am the senior product manager here at Merkle Science. Um, before that, I was actually at BlockFi uh, on the risk and fraud team there for uh, almost two years. Uh, and then before that, over at Riskified, uh, which is also in the risk and fraud space. Uh, but uh, been in the crypto community since uh, early 2013. Uh, Ronald, over to you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, my name is Ronald. I am currently the uh, business development partnerships lead for ContentFi. It's an IP monetization platform. Um, prior to this, I was the uh, head of corporate and high net worth loans in Celsius Network. And prior to that, I was with Huobi Exchange uh, dealing with business development um, in the EMEA region. Great. I'm glad to uh, be on the panel, both of you. And interesting since you both have, uh, you know, inside knowledge with uh, with Celsius and BlockFi. So uh, interesting to hear some of your, your comments and thoughts on some of the topics. Uh, so let's let's start off. So let, let's talk about, um, you know, what's on everybody's mind, FTX, um, obviously the, the bankruptcy and, and the and the arrest. Um, you know, just let's start off. What, what, what do you think went wrong? Like what happened? There's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of, you know, you know, allegations as to, you know, whether it was outright fraud or poor risk management process, whether Sam was involved, Sam wasn't involved, you know, from your perspectives, you know, in your own words, what, what do you think went wrong? Ronald, do you want to start off? Uh, yeah, certainly. So right now, you know, with the most recent uh, updates yesterday with the rest of uh, SBF, um, at this point of time, you know, whether it's innocent, negligent, or fraudulent misrepre misrepresentation of uh, whatever Celsius is doing, um, it's just a lack of, really, a lack of corporate governance and um, con centralized control of the entire exchange. Uh, nobody knew what was going on. Everything was siloed off uh, to the rest of the employees, something that we see is quite common in the crypto scene and causing a lot of panic, um, you know. Uh, this is just one area that uh, we're aware of that's gone on. Um, I think there's still so much to understand and um, to review. And we'll, we'll just literally learn more in the next couple of weeks, couple of months uh, during these court hearings. Um, but yeah, definitely a misrepresentation on the business of FTX and what they were doing with uh, Alameda with the commingling of assets that we know of so far. Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot that's still left to uncover. But uh, Ronald, to your point, there is um, a few different angles to this, right? Um, so I'm not sure if uh, the audience here has seen the CoffeeZilla interview, which I highly recommend, by the way, um, where he literally was able to corner SBF into uh, almost admitting that he was intentionally commingling funds. Um, so I think what we'll realize over the course of the next few months um, and if anyone doesn't know yet, F SPF is in jail today. So um, he will be charged uh, accordingly. There's a, a few different cases that have come out of it. But um, as it relates to the kind of like contagion effect uh, affecting uh, like both of our previous companies, Celsius and, and BlockFi, um, there uh, was a lot of dependency on some of those funds. Um, if uh, I don't know if the audience is familiar with the total uh, the FTX and BlockFi relationship. So just a quick overview. Um, BlockFi was basically on, on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, FTX basically stepped in and offered to uh, offered a credit line to BlockFi, which um, at that point BlockFi did take, um, which it was basically the only health line available to them. Um, they were also unaware or um, it, to my knowledge, we were uh, BlockFi was unaware of these funds actually being used uh, from the customer side of, uh, of the equation. But um, a lot of. Uh, uh, the participants there uh, tried, did try to make the best decisions. And one of the key values that uh, was part of this deal was that the retail customer funds would be safe, right? So that was, um, that's been kind of like the backstory for all of this contagion. It's, it's always been, let's make sure that our clients and our, and our retail customers don't get affected um, by bad decisions on, on the risk management side. However, the tables seem to have turned on Sam himself when um, you can literally see quotes of him saying that, oh, yeah, we want to protect the retail customer. But at the same time, 
um, he did not have controls in place to separate uh, uh, the funds from the uh, from the retail customers uh, and uh, and the margin account. Um, so basically, uh, the term he used was fungible, right? So um, if you can commingle funds, then it's not really sectioned off in any appropriate way. And there wasn't much like actual like transparency into this, right? So I think that's been one of the biggest challenges. And over the course of the next few weeks, we'll see that transparency is going to play a key part of this, and we're going to start uncovering a lot more details. And uh, something tells me the rabbit hole still has a, a way a ways to go. Yeah, I mean, not to turn this into a legal conversation, but I think you know one of the concerns that I personally have is you know I don't know if they'll be able to prove you know or you know that his actions rose to the level of criminal, right? You know he intentionally ignored risk, you know, traditional risk management practices and or commingling funds, which you shouldn't be able to do, which will, you know, obviously in, impose, you know, personal and civil liability against him for, you know, be able to pierce the corporate veil of, you know, the two different entities. But, you know, whether or not you can actually prove outright fraud, I think it's going to have to be through discovery and just through, you know, internal communications of, hey, I'm going to, you know, actively defraud, you know, our, our clients as opposed to just, you know, let me YOLO, um, you know, you know, risk management practices. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to touch on, you know, the potential violation of, of the terms of service and, uh, you know, also the misappropriation of user funds. Um, you know, so, you know, I'll, I'll let you start this time. Can you just give us your perspective on that? Uh, yeah, so basically what was happening, and this is just based off of the, uh, the, the latest interviews that I've seen uh, with CoffeeZilla and, and a few others, um, I, FTX was taking customer funds and then funneling them into Alameda. And Alameda was effectively bankrupt uh, earlier this year in you know early Q2. Um, so the challenge there was uh, that Sam had to, or the team there had to make a decision on whether they wanted to declare bankruptcy on Alameda or continue the uh, continue using funds, uh, misappropriating those funds and using them to keep Alameda afloat. Although uh, even with those funds, they were uh, unable to uh, keep the solvency level um, for Alameda as well as for FTX, right? So um, the controls that need to be in place when you're looking at crypto is um, obviously like there's uh, different programs that uh, our users sign up for. So if you're signing up for a margin account, you're actively agreeing to different terms of services and agreeing to a higher level of risk uh, with your funds. What happens is when you when you have a retail customer that is specifically not using like margin accounts and specifically not trying to take risk and just moving their funds uh, on platform as a as a custodian or a, a, a proxy to a custodian. Um, what happens is that you're not informing your customers of that level of risk. So the challenge here is is, yes, there was misappropriation of the funds, but it was more so that the terms and conditions were breached um, and the clients. Uh, on the retail side, were not notified that their funds were being misallocated or rehypothecated or being used to bail out uh, another company. So, what do you think, like the overall implications of you know the FTX, BlockFi, and then obviously we can you know we can loop in you know the Celsiuses and the Voyagers of the world. Like, what do you think the overall impact is going to be? You know, give me your twelve, twenty-four, even thirty-six month you know vision of, of, of where do you think we're going to end up? Uh, Ronald, we'll we'll start with you on this one. Sure. Uh, going back to what you used earlier, the, the discovery. Uh, this is definitely what we'll be uh, exploring in the next few months. We don't know exactly how much of the um, assets are. Stuff in FTX, uh, in terms of the millions of dollars of, you know, um, other exchanges funds, um, even if they're not exposed to FTT themselves or have loans with FTX, um, there will be a wider uh, impact on whether you know the courts will look at this and say, hey, these are are, are these assets going to be uh, considered? Because again, let's take a step back to uh, what we've learned recently. Um, with the lack of fi proper financial rec recording, uh, we will be seeing quite a big mess of, um, or rather a wave of uh, creditors coming in to claim what is theirs and what's not, um, what, what belongs to them. Um, and I think taking going back to the terms of services that um, Neil just talked about, um, customer assets, that are on the platform really should be considered as liabilities, um, right? 
and what FTX considered them were as their own assets, which we've also seen what happened with uh, Celsius and maybe other uh, exchanges are uh, starting to realize, hey, this is a um, uh, wrong categorization of the, the customer's assets. Um, will we see more exchanges um, realizing their mistakes and un understanding that they've um, misrepresented their own users' funds? I think over the next couple of months, we will see a lot of exchanges start to review their own process. We already are seeing a lot of, you know, uh, exchanges are doing some self um, self regulation, uh, following keeping up to date on the latest practices. Whether or not this will um, lead to a deeper hole, uh, we, we we honestly won't know until we'll, we'll see in a couple of months' time, right? Um, sorry, Neil, if you want to add on to that. Yeah, yeah, happy to jump in. So um, the implications of this, right? So obviously this is uh, rang uh, uh, bells across the world and you're going to see a lot of regulatory agencies, um, a lot of states, a lot of governments starting to crack down on how these firms operate. So obviously there's going to be, uh, you know, more guidance, more controls. But what this really does is it, it does two things. One, it separates, uh, uh, you know, self custody versus, uh, keeping your, your crypto on a, on an exchange, right? So there's obviously centralized exchanges. There's also decentralized exchanges, right? So, uh, I don't think that the war has been won yet. This is just a single battle. And in this case, the decentralized platforms have won out in this battle. But in the longer term, I think what this is going to do is uh, it's going to significantly tighten the controls that governments have around crypto and how crypto is used and where it's used and how it's uh, how people even move funds. Right. So um, there is a, a like there's already things like travel rule. There's already um, uh, KYC practices that need to be implemented uh, across all of these uh, centralized exchanges. What's going to happen is that's going to get uh, more tight and it's going to require more due diligence from not only the the parties themselves but regulators uh, will come in and request specific um, uh, guidelines to be followed and they'll actually do uh, some form of like actual like auditing right i don't think this is going to be like full audit of all of these firms which would be incredibly hard to do and to ronald's point there will be some self-auditing that happens with these exchanges uh, i'm brought back to sbf's quote a couple of months back where he said you know, so some exchanges might secretly be insolvent. Um, we'll, we'll start seeing that more and more now, especially because they're going to have to start providing um, evidence that, you know, funds are not being commingled. And when that starts happening, there will be a lot of cleanup, but there will be a lot of collateral damage that comes out of this. Um, some of these exchanges will go bankrupt. Others will uh, find a fix. Uh, some will need loans to, to get to a point where they can remain solvent and, and separate those funds. Uh, but uh, uh, we won't know again in, uh, for the next few months, at least. OK, um, you know, we're, we're definitely going to touch on this later when we go over the lessons learned. But, you know, one of the things I do want to address when we get to that section is, you know, in my personal opinion, the danger of shouting from the rooftops, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. Um, I think sense a dangerous precedent because I think, you know, most I'll say most, but a decent amount of, you know, crypto holders are not adequately prepared to hold their own keys. So I think, you know, sending that message is causing a run on the exchanges, which is just, you know, kind of perpetuating the problem. You know, if everybody today went to their bank and withdrew all their cash, you'd have the same issues with the banks. Um, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the same business practice. You know, you take deposits and you loan them out and, you know, you hope that the, you know, they'll be able to pay back the loans. I think it's just done in a more of a pragmatic and you know risk averse way. But yeah, we'll we'll definitely touch on that a little bit. We do have a, a question that came in, and just everybody for the audience, you know, feel free, you know, throughout the the uh, the webinar to, to post your questions, and I'll, I'll read them as they come in. Uh, so we have a question here. Um, question is, uh, what do you think about the current efforts of centralized exchanges uh, to pr do proof of reserves, uh, which actually is the next topic we're going to get into. And where might some of these companies be falling short in those efforts? And how do you see the transparency initiatives evolving? So, um, Ronald, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, if we're jumping straight into proof of reserves. So, well, for those who are not very familiar, proof of reserve is literally is just a definitive proof of assets collateralized on chain. Uh, the purpose is just to be more transparent. Now, um, end of the day, proof of reserve is just checking um, whether there's sufficient collateral 
um, on a platform. I think one of the main things that we have to really understand is, you know, um, some platforms right now, they are doing reports or audits. We have to be very clear on the diff distinct difference on what these are. Audits to check on solvency versus uh, some reports that companies are doing to check um, what they call AUP, agreed upon procedures, which is what we have seen um, Binance, I believe they've done recently, right? Uh, what FTX have done is they had some um, proof of collateral instead of proof of reserves. So they took advantage of the accounting floor that made basically made FTX a bit more solvent than by artificially inflating their own FTT token, right? The, the problem with uh, proof of reserve, there are other complexities like how can you, uh, why is taking so long for Binance, for example, is because there are also cross chain complexities in looking at the proof of reserves. And I think we're, we'll, we'll dive a lot deeper into this later on, um, but proof of reserve is very much one-sided because it does not take into consideration uh, liabilities of customer funds, right? Then uh, this is uh, talking about proof of liabilities. There has to be a balance of both. Um, before I go on further, you wanna add on to that, Neil? Yeah, happy to. So um, basically the, the equation, um, <clears throat> as Nick Carter had uh, uh, described it, was you take proof of reserves and you add proof of liability and you get proof of solvency, right? So the holy grail is proof of solvency, but there's a couple of challenges um, that uh, obviously the audience knows here. The first one is that how do you prove that um, the funds that you're saying that you have, you actually own, right? So a lot of these exchanges are now coming out and saying, oh, we do proof of reserves. Here are our, our hot and cold wallets. You can see the balance. You can see the allocation. So there's a great Nansen dashboard that if uh, if you look online, you can basically see these uh, these uh, these assets assets and where they're allocated uh, for those exchanges. Uh, it doesn't take into consideration that second piece, which is the liability side, right? So the liabilities are your creditors, right? And in this case, your retail customers are your creditors because it's not your funds; it's their funds, and you're holding on to them. So um, we're seeing that a lot of these exchanges are moving towards that, like proving one-to-one -one, um, uh, holdings, right? Some some exchanges are even saying that we hold 105% uh, in, in reserve, right? So the, the main piece here is that the solvency uh, component is what's valuable. Um, and to get solvency, you need to have a third-party audit, right? For actually the whole process here, the reserve part, you need to be able to prove that A, you actually own those wallets. So like Binance could put up a hot wallet that doesn't actually belong to them. Um, so they need to actually sign uh, a transaction to prove that they own that wallet. The second piece is that we're unable to determine um, on a continuous basis that those reserves are still in those wallets. So uh, Binance uh, had, a, had a situation and even crypto.com had a situation where they did do a snapshot of proof of reserves at a point in time, but they were unable to uh, maintain that. In fact, like you saw transactions moving out of that platform um, after the snapshot in time was taken. And then the third piece of that is how do you create an immutable record, right? So you have your reserves, you have your liability. Um, the immutable record piece is that you're allowing anyone who um, has an account with you on both the reserve and liability side to actually query and look up their uh, the uh, the holdings that they have. So if I um, had a couple of Bitcoin with Crypto.com, I should be able to put my um, my details in and pull up the balance uh, that is available to me. Um, what this does, is, so there's three prongs, right? There's the the real timeness, meaning that it can be proven at any point in time, and so there's no shift or uh, transactions going in and out. So you have a more of like a real time balance. The second is that you're proving ownership of those wallets. And then the third part is that you're actually making an immutable record that can't be changed over time. So um, to do this, it's very, very difficult. And which is why most of these exchanges haven't been able to do it successfully, right? So when, when the term proof of reserve is used, I think it's being misrepresented. And what uh, the proof of reserves term is being uh, used as a proxy for is proof of solvency. So as long as I can say I have this reserve and I have this liability and I show you 105 percent, um, you'll back off. Right. You're trying to uh, basically reduce the, the FUD in, in the market so that you don't have a bank run. Um, in, in reality, to do an audit like this takes months it, it, today. Right. So you would hire a third party. 
um, to come in and do a full audit, look at your reserves, look at your liabilities, and then present you with a t at a point in time referenced uh, to what you, uh, the level of sol solvency that you have as an organization. Um, and to answer the question a little bit more directly, um, do these efforts fall short? I would say yes, right? Uh, because it will require ongoing audits. It's not a it's something that you can do once a quarter or once a year and, and hope that your balances remain the same because um, as you all know, crypto transfers extremely quickly. So I can take a snapshot today and tomorrow can be completely insolvent. So I don't think it actually solves the issue. It's a direction, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't solve the, the main problem that, that most of these clients will have. So there's a couple of, um, a couple of different things that I want to double click on. You know, I, I, hundred percent agree with your, you know, proof of reserves really is really proof of solvency. And I think it's, and I want to touch on, you know, proof of liabilities, you know, if you, would love to hear if you have any thoughts on how a company can effectively do that, because uh, a lot of those liabilities may be off chain. So, you know, what would be the challenges for for an exchange to do those proof of liabilities? So I guess my question back to, to both of you is, is the current iteration of proof of reserves actually useful? You know, it's a point in time um, at the moment. It's, um, you know, doesn't actually show the liability. So is it creating a full sense of confidence in the market? You know, like, again, not to pick on, you know, crypto.com, but, you know, accidentally sending, you know, was it $400 million to the wrong exchange? You know, they got it back, which is great. But if they sent it to somebody else, they just would have lost $400 million. And if you're one of, you know, their users and you see, OK, proof of, you know, proof of reserves, they have the cash, we're good. And 10 seconds later, there's $400 million missing. So what value does the current proposed proof of reserve actually provide, if any? So if I may, uh, just to start this off. Um, it is definitely a step in the right direction. There's still a lot more uh, that we need to address beyond uh, proof of solvency um, on chain. So I'm going to throw in a curveball here, right? Um, as we said, this the flaw in this report is it's a snapshot in time. As uh, Boris just pointed out in his Q and A, um, the balance can be put near real time, um, not just a snapshot. But what about assets off chain? off-chain liabilities, right? Uh, what if there's a, you know, from my position, I'm familiar with things like uncollateralized loans um, or just loans being done off-chain in cash. Uh, these are not recorded on-chain. We still do not have the tools or at least I'm not aware of, even if there is, it's not sophisticated, sophisticated enough uh, to provide these sort of financial reporting. Right. Um, look at Coinbase. You know they're a public traded company, so the balance sheet is readily really, uh, readily available. But a lot of private companies, uh, we don't know. So I would say it's a combination of both. At the end of the day, we need to consider a uh, proof of reserve is definitely a step in the right direction, but it's not a complete picture. It's just a piece of the puzzle. Uh, yeah. To add on to that. Uh... Uh, basically on the liability side, it's very difficult to do today, right? And yes, it is a snapshot in time today. It's a, because these audits can take six months to a year to complete, depending on how large the organization is and how many resources you have to actually do those audits. Um, the challenge is that you will probably never get to 100% confidence or 100% coverage just because crypto works in, in very different ways than the fiat system does, right? So and you have unique challenges such as um, staking, you have... Uh, collateralized loans, uncollateralized loans. Um, you have funds moving from multiple entities inside a specific exchange. So like if you look at Binance, Binance has uh, Binance US, um, it has uh, different entities for different countries. So uh, when you're looking at it as an auditor, it becomes extremely complicated and extremely difficult to track those funds and to make sure that those funds are actually being used for legitimate business purposes. They're not being used for uh, any type of illicit activity in 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 the sense that you're you're moving funds for um, um, like the FTX example, uh, trying to save one of your entities, right? So this commingling of funds doesn't necessarily stop at just the retail side. It also, um, you know, needs to be considered at this higher level, like entity level side as well. Um, the way that I think that you know the industry will move is that you probably won't have a real time proof of liability. What you'll have is some proxy, and this would be something equivalent to like a uh, like a PE ratio or a or a financial health score or a financial stability score 
um, that will be uh, generated from these initial uh, data elements, right? So um, uh, when you have a hot or cold wallet that an exchange says this is owned by us, um, yes, you can identify that wallet on chain and you can identify which exchange owns it, but that exchange also needs to claim it, right? So it's similar to like a, a Google business. You, the exchange also needs to go in and claim the business and confirm that they own that account. And then the second thing is um, these exchanges own hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of wallets uh, because each individual uh, client that they have has their own individual wallet. So what you're trying to do is now create clusters of um, uh, like uh, like high level uh, entities like this is Binance and then Binance owns uh, these you know hundreds of thousands of uh, of, of hot and cold wallets. Uh, you're now trying to link those back to the main entity. But now, how do you differentiate which ones are retail clients and which ones are internal wallets for business purposes or for uh, the various different products that you have, right? So um, in order to do this, it requires a significant deep dive into the policies and procedures of each of these organizations, and it will be highly regulated uh, for to, to get this right. Um, no one will self-present all of their, uh, you know, wallets. And, you know, there's a few examples on the market. I won't, I, I won't say any names. But, um, you know, they're concerned about the privacy of their customers if they post these wallets publicly. Right. So you have this uh, this sliding scale of like increasing re uh, regulation and increasing the challenges of, uh, you know, proving to your clients that your reserves are there. But at the same time, you're sacrificing uh, the other end of the spectrum, which is the privacy and uh, the ability for your clients to remain anonymous. Right. So. The one reason why we're moving away from centralized parties is because that all of your all of your information is stored on a single server. And if a bank were to get, have a breach, all of your data would be publicly available. So crypto was a way for us to get get away from that. But what's happening is that we're also turning into that same kind of uh, scenario where in order to protect the customers, you will need to sacrifice some level of privacy. Right. Well, we have a question that came in and it, and it kind of also touches on a, an, an area that I, so I'll read you the question, but I also want you to think about the question. Um, should exchanges move from omnibus to segregated wallets? Um, but the question here, and I think this kind of ties into the question, is if a wallet has a known association with an exchange and proven ownership, can't the balance just be pulled in near real time? And I said, Neil said that only a snapshot is possible. Yeah, so. Um... The, uh, the snapshot is uh, is is available for uh, any wallet, right? So it's on chain. That's the beauty of the blockchain. You can literally look up any wallet at any point in time and see the funds. Uh, the challenge is that once you've created that snapshot and you step away, um, those funds could move after the fact, right? So um, unless you have alerting mechanisms that let you know when there's suspicious uh, movement of funds, um, you won't be made aware of that until you perform your next snapshot in time, right? So uh, the real timeness uh, is 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 will be, need to be layered with um, some type of alerting mechanism or some type of health status that lets you know when there is um, suspicious activity on that wallet. So even if it's a retail wallet, right? Um, like, for example, uh, I have a wallet with Binance and Binance decides to take my money and use it elsewhere. How do I get notified that Binance has moved my funds? Um, I don't even have access to, um, sometimes I don't even have access to the address that I'm used, using for that wallet because uh, it's it's changing, um, you know, every time you deposit, it's a new wallet address. So um, what happens is that you need to be able to um, identify which wallets belong to you and you need to be able to query them, right? That's the part of the, um, when we talk about proof of reserves, there's a component called uh, the Merkle root, right? The Merkle and and I'll, I'll represent here. Uh, Merkle Science, Merkle Root, we're not actually related, but it's similar. Um, it, Merkle Root is essentially a um, a process. So the Merkle Tree is a, is a one-way hashing algorithm where you put all, a data on one side and it encrypts it on and basically get a very unique output. Um, in order for me to make sure that the funds are there, I need to be able to query and make sure that my funds are uh, the, the right amount and, and the right wallet is, is showing up. Um, there's no way to do that today. We could make these available, but it, then it becomes a challenge of like, how often do you do this query and how do you alert a user when those funds are moved on their behalf without their permission? Because the point of an exchange is that you don't own the keys and you don't um, you don't sign off on when those funds are moved. They own the keys so they can move funds in and out. And uh, on your 
public interface, like when you log into the exchange, it could show you an amount, but that doesn't necessarily need to reflect what's actually in the wallet. Not saying that's true, but um, these are some of the challenges that you'll have. Okay, uh, before we move on, Ronald, anything to add? Uh, not at this point. Okay. All right, so let's let's move on to our last section, uh, talking about the lessons uh, in the wake of the FTX, Celsius, BlockFi, Voyager, you know, and unfortunately the ones that are probably you know haven't been announced yet. Um, you know, what what are some of the the big takeaways? Like, if you can give me like you know your top three that you know if you can snap your fingers and the you know the ecosystem can immediately change how they do business. You know, what would those be? Ron, uh, do you want to so, start? So yeah, certainly. So. Uh, definitely, uh, new standards are definitely required to be implemented that does not yet exist just because crypto as an industry itself is relatively new, right? Uh, and we're seeing so many of these popping up um, every time such a bankruptcy or such a failure of a centralized exchange um, happens. At the same time, I believe we will also see some exchanges looking for alternative methods in order to protect their users. Um, in many different ways, starting with education, which is where we're really sorely lacking. Education on leverage. You know, when people take a loan, they don't understand that they're really on leverage, that the collateral are at risk of liquidations if, if the market falls. You'd be surprised on how many people do not understand how crypto loans or even margins actually work on the back end. When the market crashes, they will be liquidated. And on the back end of that, a lot of exchanges are also having um, problems liquidating these assets when you're talking about massive volumes, right? Um, look at what happened in the summer of this year when uh, the market crashed and we saw a cascading liquidation happen uh, inside Celsius and many other exchanges. There, there are no proper guardrails to dampen the impact on this broader market. We saw a bloodshed across the streets. Um, and I think this is something that more exchanges will start to uh, look for solutions on some sort of guardrails. Whether, but another question is whether it's the right thing for exchanges to to pause such transactions to prevent such an impact towards the market. I know a lot of mechanisms still do not exist um, in a lot of exchanges for larger volumes. Um, it's just impossible at this point. We're just too too early. Um, so exchanges will definitely be continuing, you know, improving their process. At the same time, maybe some other solutions will come out um, that has not yet been, prese been presented. I'm observing a few uh, small exchanges coming out with very innovative methods of allowing users to do um, self-custody wallets and utilize the exchange, um, integrating DEXs to centralized platforms. You know, maybe we'll see a little bit more of that. Um, maybe, you know, uh, new innovative uh, tools, products will be coming out in this market. We will see. But definitely education is something that uh, we need more guidance in the space from uh, regulators. Because at the moment, going back to my initial point, the standards do not exist yet. Or uh, even if they do, um, there's still so many unknowns that we aren't aware of until the next uh, failure occurs for us to uh, start reviewing um, every every single action, every single uh, procedures or protocols that we have uh, currently in place. So, um, yeah, that's just my two cents of it. Yeah, I think you nailed it, Ronald. Um, I think what we're seeing is is two sides, right? One side is going to be the individuals that want to use DEXs and self-custody, um, that market will continue to increase, but probably at a slower rate than the opposite end of the spectrum, which will be these uh, public entities or um, these uh, less crypto um, experienced users, right? So um, everyone will have to go through this learning process, but what will happen in the, in the interim, I think, will be that you're going to have similar practices that you see on the traditional finance side of things, right? You're going to have uh, controls that come in and say only accredited investors can buy certain types of uh, um, assets, right? Like, so uh, obviously you have your commodities like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but you'll have other smaller 
uh, players that will be considered more of like a startup where, you know, if it's just typical security, you need to be an accredited investor or you need to have um, uh, the right uh, uh, controls in place. Like, so you'll probably have to reach out to a fund that can uh, basically qualify you before you can invest your money. And this way they can basically explain all the risks to you. Um, so there will be this huge shift. Uh, I think there is a lot of education that's required on both sides. Uh, but in the interim, I think this opens up um, a gap in the armor of, of crypto, and it allows regulators to really go in and start uh, influencing how uh, these companies, uh, you know, manage their uh, their auditing practices and, and the liquidity management and the risk management. There will be a lot more controls in place, and you'll have more companies um, uh, go into the public sector, right? So you'll have more companies competing with Coinbase and and and, uh, and Gemini and and other uh, exchanges of the of that like. But you also have smaller players like DEXs uh, come in and start offering more user-friendly versions of these applications. Because I think David was hinting at it earlier, um, you know, self-custody isn't a solution for everybody. Um, and I think even CZ posted like 99% of people will lose their money if they try to do a self-custody kind of solution. Because um, like uh, there's there's some like best practices that you need to do, even if you're doing self-custody, like hiding your keys, like not taking a photo of it and putting it on iCloud. Um like not forgetting your passwords or uh, there's there's basically a lot of different uh, potholes that you can hit on the self custody side. So uh, you'll, uh, I think what we'll see is like people will fall into one of those two buckets. Either you can do self custody and you take a higher risk there, um, or you go the public route and you um, take less of a risk, but there's risks on both sides. It, it just will become a matter of like where the market trends to. And my feeling is that majority of people, and in fact, like 90, 95% will probably uh, do the uh, the public route and the more regulated route, um, which is um, honestly uh, not the best for crypto, but uh, it is what it is, at least for now. So so that, that's interesting. Let, let's talk about what is the best for crypto. You know, you, you uttered the words accredited investor, and I'm sure, you know, half of the audience or half of the people that are going to be listening are probably rolling their eyes because now it's going to you know, sound and feel just like our traditional finance system, which was supposed to be, you know, why we were creating this this new ecosystem. Do you think that this is going to create like kind of a fracture within the crypto ecosystem where you still have the, you know, the OG crypto libertarians who want their own, you know, money system and don't want to adhere to regulation? And you're going to start seeing, you know, companies move, not that they already haven't, but, you know, in, you know, faster moving to jurisdictions where there is no regulation uh, in order to avoid having to ask people if they're an accredited investor. Um, or do you think that, you know, that will slowly die out and then the touch and feel of the crypto ecosystem will, will feel very much like a TradFi, but just digital? Um, yeah, so th there's a lot in there. Uh, but to, to your, uh, the answer is yes, across the board. It's you're going to see um, uh, it be uh, the whole crypto space will will fall into one of those two categories. Right. And I, m something tells me that the the side that does self-custody and doesn't want to uh, do KYC and deal with these exchanges will be very limited. And those people have already left um, these jurisdictions. Right. Um, like even if you just look at like the U.S., like where do most like crypto millionaires and billionaires go? They go to Puerto Rico. Right. It's not just for the taxes. It's it's for less regulation. Um, and as you have other countries starting in, to announce like less regulation, like El Salvador, you're going to see some what of an exodus out of highly regulated countries into these less regulated country. Uh, I know taxes are uh, appealing to most people like uh, it's it's great to, to not be taxed on crypto, but um, there will be some cost to it. Right. And sometimes that cost doesn't isn't a monetary cost. It's a it's a cost of like, you know, uh, waiting a week to get your package in Puerto Rico from Amazon. Um, but uh, on the other side, um, uh, you're right, David. Uh, what, what's going to happen is that all of these uh, traditional finance rails will slowly evolve into um, crypto-friendly rails, right? You, it, the shift will be almost um, unnoticeable. Um, and what I mean by that is you'll see JP Morgan Chase one day uh, launch their coin and your bank account will no longer say USD. It might just say JP Morgan coin or whatever they want to call it, right? And you'll be able to transact the exact same way because what you're looking at at the end of the day is your use your balance. And if you go to a Starbucks and you use your JP Morgan coin, um, it will run on the crypto rails. It will be faster. It will be based on blockchain, but the experience to you as a user will be almost identical.
Uh, so just adding on to Neil as well, and this is also just my opinion. I do see uh, in the future we will have uh, what they call public pools and compliant pools. And funny you mentioned about the travel rule early on in our conversation, um, because this is what's required for um, your institutions, your banks, your hedge funds, and all the family office sovereign funds to be able to interact with any of these um, regulated exchanges. So rightly so, um, you know, we we want to see this money coming in to the space. We want to see if we're ever going to see a half a million dollar, one million dollar Bitcoin, where's the money coming from? Where's the liquidity coming from? It will come from sovereign funds. It will come from institutions in a ready, regulated space. So hence, regulated or compliant pools will be formed. And then on the other extreme would be the public pools, you know, your El Salvador's, your non-regulated space. And then we'll see a new problem in the industry, which is uh, adding on to the travel rule, they call the sunrise situation on, you know, how does money from an unregulated country get access to liquidity in let's say South Korea or Singapore or regulated space and we will see that's a whole new problem which we will have to explore in the future. Uh, some people are already looking at that, looking for solutions, but this seems to be the direction we're going in a larger scale. Uh, at least this is what I'm seeing from my end. Um, so it's going to be an interesting one to watch. Do you think the community or the ecosystem is itself to blame for this? I mean, the the... The, the yield that's being offered on some of these products are just, you know, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. You can't, you know, un, you know, unless you're Sam, you know, print money out of thin air, um, you know, the, the yield has to be coming from somewhere. So either it's coming from poor risk management, incredibly risky loans, uh, lack of budgets and spending on, you know, security or operations. Like you can't just make up money out of thin air unless you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. So are we to blame for kind of pushing the industry into this, you know, where a you know, situation where, you know, people are just need to earn that yield? I think, you know, greed is human nature. Um, when Luna is the best example for this with the anchor protocol at 20% APR on UST, um, there were people, you know, ringing warning bells that this is, um, this is not going to last. Um, everyone was chasing yield and more and more exchanges tried to compete against that yield and um, led to the downfall of many um, protocols and platforms. Uh, I think yield is something that people don't really understand. Um, people were chasing, you know, um, I hate to bring it up, but people were chasing yield over custody accounts. Um, and that led to a lot of complications uh, in the process. Um, I think people need to take a step back and really understand what the crypto technology is, what um, potential uh, it can unlock rather than simply going after yield. Um, sometimes just holding the assets itself um, and the asset appreciation may be better than uh, chasing the yield at, in comparison to the risk involved. Um, yeah, just, you know, Neil, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I, I think uh, greed is definitely a part of human nature as well, right? Like we're always going to go for that extra 1%, 2%. Um, but Ronald, to your point, right? It's uh, you're trying to pick up pennies in front of a steamroller. Like you can, um, should you? Probably not, right? So I think these uh, these things will always exist. It's not something that even if you start educating the community and you're explaining why, you know, self-custody is better. Um, you know, there, there's that phrase that there's a sucker born every minute and there will always be uh, someone who's willing to take that risk, right? For some people that risk uh, uh, is, is required, right? So if you look at some of these other countries where it's, it's, uh, they're not as, uh, um, you know, as fluent in uh, financial uh, literacy, uh, they will go for these types of products, right? And there will always be uh, some scheme or some uh, uh, some model that, you know, looks and acts like a Ponzi, but is labeled differently. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that. Um, but I think what, what's going to happen is you're going to see that the community is going to vote 
on, and this is what I meant by the battle versus the war, right? The war is going to be between, um, you know, self custody and uh, these uh, more regulated and centralized pl- uh, players. Um, right now, it's looking like the the tide is leaning towards the centralized players because it's incredibly hard um, to spread this much information from like a crypto knowledge standpoint and financial literacy standpoint that just onboarding you know millions or even billions of of, of new uh, uh, of customers it's it's going to be very difficult right so unless you're doing this more regulated route which has its downsides right like there if you continue going this, down this regulated route you could have a completely surveillance state kind of approach where anytime you pr- perform a transaction on the blockchain um, the government can decide where you spend your money and on the other end of the spectrum you'll have uh, the bitcoin maxis who uh, have run their own nodes and only transact in bitcoin right so um, you'll have this kind of like a sliding scale in between but at this point it looks like that the majority is leaning towards that centralized approach just because it's safer for them, uh, it, it they might be sacrificing some of that um, risk um, um, to, to also like get some uh, more guidance or protection on the financial side. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, David. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to follow up also. So you know, as far as let's let's talk, let's go back to like you know standard risk management. You know, what type of internal and external controls do you think that the crypto businesses are missing today? That you know potentially you know would have prevented an FTX um, or or even a BlockFi. Not that BlockFi did anything intentional, but you know what kind of controls in place would have prevented you know what happened to BlockFi or, or FTX, etc. So uh, definitely. Tra- oh, sorry, ahead, Ronald. Um, yeah, I was just going to say definitely requiring more security protocols um, to restrict the risk of commingling of funds. You know whether it's alerts to. Um, you know, third-party auditors um, to, you know, to keep track of um, the funds are not being uh, used the way it's not supposed to be used, you know, transparent on-chain, more more transparency on-chain that can be public verifiable is uh, definitely something that um, everyone will start looking at. Whether we will see more uh, corporate compliance programs coming in, uh, to manage the conducts within the company, within the business, um, we don't know whether companies are truly being honest. But it's, it's you know, there's no guarantee. So, will this be a third-party compliance solution that we'll be looking at? But definitely, more uh, corporate governance um, is something that crypto businesses will be incorporating. Um, and going back to what I st- uh, stated earlier on about standards, you know, accounting standards and some of these language. Uh, still do not yet exist. Uh, one of my colleagues um, this is, is looking into addressing this issue in terms of like how can you ensure proper accounting between on-chain, off-chain uh, to, to entities. Um, because there's still a massive gap um, that needs to be filled in this space. Um, definitely more stress testing required <laughs> for centralized exchanges. This is something I think we'll be seeing more often now. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, Ronald. Um, I also think that this is um, going to be very similar to the traditional finance space, right? We're, we're going to have like the same type of controls come in. Um, however, I don't even think traditional finance has, has solved some of these problems, right? And so if you look at 2008, um, it, it, these are banks. These are regulated banks, right? They, they have all of the controls and, and regulations in place. And yet, um, who gets fined the most for for uh, these types of like sanctions or you know money laundering? It's it's actually the banks, right? Crypto is a very small percentage of this. So um, what what I'm seeing is that it, like the only difference between traditional finance and crypto is that at least traditional finance has somebody that can bail them out, right? Uh, in crypto, you don't have anyone to bail you out. Like sure, SBF was supposed to be the guy, but um, he's not. And maybe CZ isn't either, right? So this becomes more of a, uh, a self-managed, uh, self kind of like risk management best practices that you need to instill and and kind of just educate yourself on. Um, do you like again? You can still get screwed over in the traditional space as well. Like you can you can go margin and on Robinhood and lose everything. So uh, there's there's not much that that's going to be different. It's just going to be uh, the fact that. It took, you know, traditional finance, maybe, you know, hundreds of years to get to this point. And it's taking crypto, 
you know, less than uh, less than, uh, you know, a century to, to get there. We're very, very early. So, you know, some of the technologies that um, that are in the space are very early. Um, most of them don't even uh, like the real solutions don't even exist yet. And I think people keep forgetting that. But if you compare traditional finance to to the uh, to the crypto finance space, uh, we're probably going to um, uh, uh, outpace the the innovation. We're going to have more unique solutions, um, but uh, it will come at a cost, right? You have to break some eggs to make an omelet. And I think that's the, the phase that we're going through right now. Okay, great. Uh, so let's let's turn over to um, you know closing remarks, uh, and then we'll open it up for the last couple of minutes for for questions. Um, do you wh where where do you think regulation will land in the next twelve months? Do you think we're going to see sweeping regulations over the next twelve months, or do you think it's going to be like a, a slow, steady progression of of regulations? Well, from what we've seen so far. Um, I don't believe it's going to be something that we'll see, you know, anytime soon. It will definitely be slow, taking into account all the existing failures um, and discovery that needs to be done. Um, this is something that, you know, slow and steady doesn't mean that it's bad. We want to do this right. Uh, we would definitely see more self-regulation take place first before the actual regulation. Um, there's still a struggle between, you know, who needs to be the one setting the regulation, whether it's the SEC or um, other, um, you know, uh, government entities. Um, what we will see is industry practices coming to a better level of transparency, transparency to show, you know, better security and protection of the clients. We'll see uh, third party companies um, coming up with innovative solutions. Um, end of the day, I think what we really need more of is just definitely more of education. You know, the, the whole point of the crypto industry is so that we don't have to trust. We just have to verify and everything can be done on chain if done right. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, I still tr trust exchanges to execute certain um, transactions. Um, end of the day, it's about, you know, not holding more than, uh, not holding all your funds unnecessarily on exchanges, you know, trade or do whatever, you need to do and then withdraw in self-custody or at least take the time to learn about self-custody while experimenting and using centralized exchanges um, because you know uh, there, there are resources available out there um, the whole point is so that we don't have to trust an entity we just need to uh, utilize the service on chain and just get out of there um, and protecting your own assets you know um, Neil, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, sorry, Ronald. I'm going to have to disagree. I think it's going to be the exact opposite. I think these regulations are mm -hmm. going to come hard and fast, and they might be completely wrong, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't iterate on them, right? So there is a new version of the of the of a bill that came out from Senator Loomis that basically strips away most of the value propositions that crypto has, right? So um, it uh, basically makes crypto useless. And like we were talking about before, you won't really know the difference between the traditional finance and the crypto space because uh, all of these banks will just slowly start shifting over and using blockchain as their as their uh, a protocol layer, right? Um, the reason I think this is going to happen is because um, when you have blowups like this, um, it forces... Uh, forces reactions, right? So the U.S. is obviously leading um, as well as, as much of a lead as we have on the regulatory side, but um, it'll become very easy for other countries to easily adopt similar rules and standards for their uh, crypto spaces as well. So um, as much as I'd like to say like, yeah, let's do this right, um, something tells me that they're less so focused on right and more so just blanket statements that will protect the consumer because the consumers are the ones that are um, are impacted today, right? So um, if you get like these types of blowups, and I'm sure there'll be a few more uh, down the pipe, but you're, you're going to have a lot of reactions and, and these reactions might be uh, overzealous, if anything. Yeah, interesting. Do you think this might be what caused the separation between the public and compliance um, trick pools, as I mentioned earlier? Because if compliance uh, regulation comes out wrong, um, yeah, that might cause a lot of OGs to just, you know, split away um, from exchanges. Um, yeah, this will be I think it's already happening. 
Yeah. It's already happening, right? People are taking their funds off exchanges. Like the the uh, uh, Binance had three billion dollars in withdrawals in the last 24 hours, right? It's it's only going to increase, right? Whether they're safe or not won't even be the question anymore. You're going to have this paradigm shift of people who want to do self custody and don't want to take this risk and don't want to be regulated, and then you'll have everybody else who doesn't really have a choice. Okay, that'll be great. an interesting one to watch. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, it was definitely a great discussion, and I appreciate you, you know, having me on. Uh, so thank you, Neil, and thank you, Ronald. And thank you, everybody, for attending. It's a Thanks, pleasure. everyone. Thank you.